coming up on our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1178 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System says Radio France International Transmission Splatter is untenable. Radio amateurs are on standby following the La Palma volcanic eruption. Clear frequencies are requested for possible Nicaragua earthquake traffic. International Amateur Radio Union Region 3 is considering significant expansions to HF digital allocations. Registration is open for the USA Amateur Radio Direction Finding Championships. Both the AWRL and the RSGB announced joint events to celebrate the centenary of amateur radio transatlantic success. Scientists blame night sky ambient light pollution on new internet satellite constellations. A locally owned Radio Shack store, yeah, there still are a few, is forced to close. We will have the details. And... Single sideband was slow to catch on when it was first introduced. We will have the story and point you to a great video on the topic in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, talks about bringing back forums. Leo also will tell us how Google is in the process of shutting down its wide area ISP experiment called Project Loon. And he will tell us about a railroad system in northern China that is running on the now expired Adobe Flash. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, tells us why we need more glue in our hobby. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a look at the 1927 Radio Act, which formally ended anarchy on the AM broadcast bands and formalizes amateur radio. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about the sudden stop, continued. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio, where the fall colors are just beginning to appear, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, Along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our amateur radio station in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the song of the chainsaw is being heard in our neighborhood, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where summer marches on, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, weather's finally mild this week. I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where Autumn showed Summer her ankle, Summer was not impressed. The cooler days we had were really nice, though, but it's warmer again. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off this week's news, the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System August Newsletter reports that Radio France International was active daily between 2100 and 2200 UTC on 7205 kHz. The report says splattering appeared massively down to 7186 kHz, which the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System called an untenable condition. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System said that the especially well-known intruders included voice of broad masses on 7140 and 7180 kHz from Eritrea. From time to time, China Radio International was heard on 14,000 kHz and intermodulation of 13855 kHz and 13710 kHz. The usual players among the over-the-horizon radar systems were active almost daily. These included the Russian Container System, the British Pluto from Cyprus, 
and the Foghorn over-the-horizon radar system from China. Intruders monitored in Region 1 may be causing problems elsewhere in the world as well. The Cumbre Vieja volcano on Las Palmas in Spain's Canary Islands erupted for the first time in 50 years on Sunday, September 19th, following an increase in seismic activity over the previous seven days. The lava flow triggered the evacuation of more than 6,000 people so far. Authorities have deployed all the resources of the Canary Islands government, as well as military support from the mainland to manage the situation. In order to facilitate communication into and out of the area, MCOM Spain has asked that the International Amateur Radio Union Emergency Center of Activity Frequencies be kept clear in case the situation worsens. They are 3.760 MHz, 7.110 MHz, 14.300 MHz, and 21.360 MHz. International Amateur Radio Union Region 2 Emergency Coordinator Carlos Alberto Santa Maria Gonzalez, CO2JC, has requested that radio amateurs in Central America avoid 7098 and 7198 kilohertz in the wake of an earthquake at 0957 UTC on Wednesday, September 22nd in Nicaragua. The U.S. Geological Survey said the offshore magnitude 6.5 earthquake has also affected Belize, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. The earthquake was followed by another 4.0 temblor and other aftershocks of less intensity, as confirmed by Juan de la Cruz Rodriguez Pérez, YN1J, President and National Emergency Coordinator of the Club de Radio Experimentadores de Nicaragua, or CREN. CREN is the International Amateur Radio Union Member Society for Nicaragua. The earthquake occurred offshore in the North Pacific, some 60 miles from Chinandega and approximately 52 miles southwest of the resort town of Jiquililio, Nicaragua. The U.S. Geological Survey said the quake occurred at a depth of approximately 20 miles. According to the Nicaraguan Institute for Territorial Studies, the event was related to the tectonic processes of the collision between the Cocos and Caribe tectonic plates. Emergency communicator Juan de la Cruz, YN1J, requested the frequency protection. No tsunami warning has been issued and there have been no immediate reports of damage. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, little or no landsliding is expected, but some landslides could have occurred in highly susceptible areas, and the number of people living near areas that could have produced landslides in this earthquake is low, but landslide damage or fatalities are still possible in highly susceptible areas. This is not a direct estimate of landslide fatalities or losses. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 3 Asia Online Conference hosted by Thailand's IARU member, Society Rest, wraps up on September 23rd. One topic discussed was a proposed HF band plan. Among the problems the planners seek to address is the use of bandwidth as a divining transmission characteristic. Following the revision of the tools used to describe HF amateur band plans, a joint tri-region IARU committee developed a proposal for revision of the data segments of HF amateur band. The changes proposed include a significant expansion of digital mode segments. These revisions address several areas, including global HF amateur band plan segment harmonization. Other factors include separation of conversational and time-synchronized events, a band plan segment expansion in support of time-synchronized transmission mode capability standards, mostly trading with now lesser-used RTTY subbands, more effective separation of voice and data modes on 40 meters. The relocation of IARU Region 3 MCOM SSB frequency from 3600 to 3680 kilohertz. Relocation of the global 20 meter slow scan SST frequency from 14.230 kilohertz to 14.330 kilohertz. Relocation of Japan's domestic 40-meter FT8 frequency from 7041 to 7037 kilohertz to provide for a global narrowband conversational mode like PSK, 
a segment between 7040 and 7044 kilohertz, in alignment with existing Region 1 arrangements to replace the 7070 to 7074 kilohertz segment in Region 2. And recognition of 7040 to 7060 plus 7065 to 7080 kilohertz as the new 40 meter data segment with voice operation reduced the secondary status between 7060 and 7070 kilohertz. Documents are available from the Region 1 Conference website. Special event substation is HS18IARU and was on the air during the conference. Registration is now open for the 2021 USA and IARU Region 2 Championships of Amateur Radio Direction Finding, set for October 13th through the 17th. Competition venues will be near Asheboro, North Carolina. With more details on this popular amateur radio competition, we go to league headquarters where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. Postponed from 2020, these championships will be conducted in accordance with CDC COVID-19 guidelines. ARRL ARDF co-coordinator Charles Charlau, NZ0I, calls the USA RDF championships an ideal opportunity to watch and learn from the best radio orienteers in the U.S. Winners could end up on ARDF Team USA, which will travel to Serbia for the 2022 ARDF World Championships. The competitions will include classic 2-meter and 80-meter competitions, Fox Oring, a combination of radio direction finding and classic orienteering, and pizza. Experienced radio orienteers and event organizers from the Backwoods Orienteering Club will organize the 2021 U.S. and IARU Region 2 Championships. Go to eventreg, that's all one word, eventreg.orienteeringusa, also just one word, dot org, and scroll down. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Wednesday, October 13th, will be a model event for equipment testing and a competitor briefing. Thursday, October 14th, will be devoted to the Sprint Championship, a short course with 12-second Fox transmissions instead of the usual 60 seconds. Classic 2-meter and 80-meter competitions will take place Friday and Sunday. Between the days of classic competitions will be Fox Oaring, a combination of radio direction finding and classic orienteering held on Saturday morning. An outdoor picnic will be held Saturday evening. Presentation of medals for Fox Oaring, Sprint, and Friday's classic event take place at the picnic. Awards for Sunday's classic competition will be presented immediately after the competition. Three optional practice days are planned for Sunday through Tuesday, October 10th through the 12th, just prior to the championships. A practice event on Sunday in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, will provide the experience of a full ARDF course in a friendly environment, with the clock as the only opponent. The practices on Monday and Tuesday will be held in Durham, North Carolina, and will offer informal sessions in which the participants help with setting the transmitters in the woods. Experienced radio orienteers and event organizers from the Backwoods Orienteering Club will organize the 2021 USA and IARU Region 2 Championships. The event director is Joseph Huberman, K5JGH, and the registrar is Ruth Bromer, WB4QZG. The International Amateur Radio Union sets ARDF championship rules. For scoring and awards, participants are divided into 12 age-slash-gender categories. In the classic ARDF events, competitors start in small groups made up of different categories. As they seek the FOX transmitters, they navigate through the forest from the starting corridor to the finish line, a distance ranging from 4 to 12 kilometers. They plot their direction-finding bearings on orienteering maps that show terrain features, elevation contours, and vegetation type. The USA ARDF championships are open to anyone who can safely navigate the woods by themselves. A ham radio license is not required. Each participant competes as an individual. Teamwork and GPS map use are forbidden. Competitors bring their own direction finding gear to the events, although extra gear is sometimes available for loan from other attendees. Competitors may not transmit on the course except in emergencies. Information bulletin number two contains the complete schedule, technical details, fees, rule variations, and more. Bulletins and links for online registration are on the event webpage on the BOK website. An email reflector is available for Q&A with the organizers as well as for coordinating transportation and arranging equipment loans. Announcements, rules, organizer instructions, and more are available at the AWRL ARDF website. 
Basic information on international style transmitter hunting is on the Homing In website, which covers equipment ideas for 2 meters and 80 meters, plus photos and stories from previous championships. Al Williams, Whiskey Delta 5 Golf November Romeo, writes on Hackaday about radio navigation and direction finding. You may think of radio navigation and direction finding as something fairly modern. However, it might surprise you to discover that direction finding is nearly as old as radio itself. In 1888, Heinrich Hertz noted that signals were strongest when in one orientation of a loop antenna and weakest when the antenna was rotated by 90 degrees. By 1900, experimenters noted that dipoles exhibited similar behaviour, and it wasn't long before antennas were deliberately made to rotate to either maximise the signal strength or locate the distant transmitter. Of course, there is one problem. You can't actually tell which side of the antenna is pointing to the signal with a loop or a dipole. They have a figure of eight reception pattern. So if the antenna is pointing north, the signal might be from the north, but it could also be from the south. Still, in some cases, that's enough information to be getting on with. John Stone patented a system like this in 1901. Well-known radio experimenter Lee de Forest also had a novel system in 1904. These systems all suffered from a variety of issues. At shortwave frequencies, multipath propagation can confuse the receiver, and longwave signals need very large antennas. Most antennas were rotatable, but some, like one from Marconi, used multiple elements and a switch. However, there are special cases where these limitations are acceptable. For example, when Pan Am needed to navigate airplanes over the ocean in the 1930s, Hugo Leutelitz, who had worked at RCA before Pan Am, used a loop antenna at the airport to locate a transmitter on the plane. Since you knew which side of the antenna the airplane must be on, the bidirectional detection wasn't a problem. Al's Hackaday article goes on to show how highly directional antennas were developed and tells you all about amateur radio fox hunting, which is a really popular pastime and sport within the hobby. And it doesn't involve foxes, by the way. You can read the full story at hackaday.com. The ARRL and the Radio Society of Great Britain will jointly sponsor events to celebrate the achievement of transatlantic communications by radio amateurs 100 years ago. With more on the history and the upcoming special event operations, we go to League Headquarters, where we find Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, filing this report. In December 1921, ARRL sent Paul Godley to ZE as its representative to listen for amateur signals from North America during the second transatlantic tests. Setting up his listening station in Androssen on the west coast of Scotland, Godley received the signals of more than two dozen U.S. amateur radio stations, the first on December 12th from 1BCG in Connecticut. That station was operated by members of the Radio Club of America. The successful transatlantic tests and the ones that followed spurred technological advances and new global wireless distance records. Several amateur radio operating events this year and next will commemorate the centenary of these significant milestones that heralded the dawn of two-way international amateur radio communication. ARRL and RSGB will activate special event stations for six hours on December 12th for the 160-meter transatlantic centenary QSO party. A lot more info about other events is on the ARRL website, www.arrl.org, or in your September 23rd edition of the ARRL Letter. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The RSGB will activate GB2ZE from Scotland, with the team of stations from the GMDX group sharing operating duties. The ARRL will activate W1AW. The stations will operate only on CW. If transatlantic propagation holds up, the stations may continue to operate beyond 0800 UTC. The GMDX group of Scotland will award a quaich, a traditional Scottish drinking cup representing friendship, 
to the first stations in North America and the UK to complete contacts with both W1AW and GB2ZE during the QSO party. A commemorative certificate will be available for download. The RSGB and ARRL are also organizing an international amateur radio marathon on the HF bands to commemorate transatlantic tests held between 1921 and 1923. The Transatlantic Centenary Marathon will take place in December 2022. The objective will be to mark these historic events by encouraging all radio amateurs to get on the air. Event details are pending. Both the ARRL and the RSGB have assembled a list of stations and groups that are also organizing events and activities to celebrate 100 years of amateur radio transatlantic communication. For more information, visit the ARRL website page, keyword transatlantic, and the rsgb.org stroke transatlantic dash tests. The sites also include links to many previously published articles and presentations covering the historic tests. Now with additional events and commemorations, we go to our own Will Rogers, K5WLR. Additional events and commemorations for the Transatlantic Communications celebration include Radio Club of America Transatlantic QSO Party, 1200 UTC on November 13th, to 0400 UTC November 14, 2021, 16 hours total. The QSO party commemorates the contribution of members of the Radio Club of America who constructed and operated the 1BCG transmitter site in Greenwich, Connecticut that sent the first message received by Paul Godley to ZE in Scotland. W1AW Commemorative Transatlantic QSL Card Stations making contact with Hiram Percy Maxim Memorial Station, W1AW, between December 11, 2021 and December 31, 2022, qualify to receive a commemorative W1AW QSL card. U.S. Station Sud QSL with an SASE, International Station Sud QSL, via the Bureau. The 2021 ARRL 160 meter contest, 2200 UTC on December 3rd to 1559 UTC on December 5th. This 42 hour CW only contest is most similar to the original transatlantic tests of the early 1920s. Stations in the US and Canada work each other as well as DXCC entities. The RSGB is planning to activate one of the original call signs used in the transatlantic tests with up to seven different prefixes from the UK and Crown dependencies. Look for G6XX England, GD6XX Isle of Man, GI6XX Northern Ireland, GJ6XX Jersey, GM6XX Scotland, GU6XX Guernsey, and GW6XX Wales. Special event GB1002ZE, December 1st through the 26th, 2021. The Crocodile Rock Amateur Group based near Ardrossan, Scotland, will activate the special event station GB1002ZE to commemorate the successful reception of amateur transatlantic signals by Paul Godley to ZE in 1921. The RSGB encourages stations in the UK and Crown dependencies to append the suffix slash 2ZE to their station's normal call sign throughout the period as authorized by UK regulator Ofcom. Some quick announcements. The International DX Association, INDEXA, will support the 3Y0J D expedition to Bouvet Island in November and December of 2022 with a grant of $15,000. Pacificon 2021, which hosts the ARRL Pacific Division Convention, is set for October 15th through the 17th, sponsored by the Mount Diablo Amateur Radio Club. The event will take place at the San Ramon Marriott. 
The Central Arizona DX Association will put the call sign K7UGA on the air October 4th through the 8th. K7UGA was the call sign of Arizona U.S. Senator Barry Goldwater, who was also the 1964 Republican Party presidential candidate. K7UGA will be on all bands and modes. Members of the Russian Robinson Club, and yes, there is such a thing, will celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty signing with special call signs that use the suffix A-N-T. Activity will be between October 1st and December 31st. The weekend of October 2nd and 3rd is designated for holding the annual ARRL Simulated Emergency Test although local and section-level exercises may take place throughout the fall. The simulated emergency test is ARRL's primary national emergency exercise and is designed to assess skills and preparedness of amateur radio emergency service volunteers, as well as those affiliated with other organizations involved in emergency and disaster response. The simulated emergency test encourages maximum participation by all radio amateurs, partner organizations, and national, state, and local officials who typically engage in emergency or disaster response. In addition to the Aries volunteers, those active in the National Traffic System, Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, National Weather Service, Skywarn, Community Emergency Response Team, and a variety of other allied groups and public service-oriented amateurs are needed to fulfill important roles in this nationwide exercise. The simulated emergency test offers volunteers an opportunity to test equipment, modes, and skills under simulated emergency conditions. Individuals can use the time to update a go kit for use during deployment and to ensure their home station's operational capability in an emergency or disaster. To get involved, contact your local ARRL emergency coordinator or net manager. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I'm here to counsel you. I'm the Dr. Laura of computing. I'm here, <laughs> I'm here to make you feel better about your pathetic hardware. No, I'm here to tell you that your hardware is not your enemy. It's your friend, even though it's mean and nasty and breaks all the time. I'm here to help you find new hardware. I'm here to spend your money. I'm here to save you money. I, you know, I'm here to do it all. Our new uh, forums. Forums are back, baby. Do you remember forums? It's funny. Some of the people in the forums saying, this is kind of like the old days of BBSs. You remember those? You probably know. Well, you have to be of a certain age to remember uh, dialing in with your your phone line. And you'd get online. <laughs> I'm old enough, I remember actually actually picking up the handset on my Western electric phone and jamming it into rubber cups. That was the modem. And then, you know, mom would pick up the other end of the, on the extension and go, Mom, get off the line, I'm on the, uh, I'm on the internet. Well, I, we didn't call it internet, did we? I'm on the BBS, BBS, the bulletin board system. So, uh, but they're back in a way. And I think some of this is because we all abandoned, didn't we? We all abandoned all of the stuff, the good stuff that we had started in the, I started at BBS in the eighties, but in the nineties and later where the internet came along and all of a sudden Twitter and Facebook and Reddit and took over from these things. These centralized uh, forums and mini blogs that became you know where you hung out but i think there's a little backlash isn't there now to uh to these big guys because they're, they're kind of i don't know they're, it's like it's like saying i'd like to talk to my friends in the middle of grand central station please it's just they're busy there's a lot going on so we started a forum uh last week it's done very well it's like the old days of uh, of forums or BBSs where you go, you create an account, and you say hi to people. And it's not a lot of people. It's maybe a thousand other people. And it's kind of people you know, you get to know over time and chat with them. And you can post pictures. And you can do the same stuff you would do on Facebook or Reddit or even Twitter. But it's but it's a little more, it's a small community. Instead of Grand Central Station, it's Petticoat Junction. It's a little a little place where you where you can hang out. The address for that is uh, community.techguylabs.com. Alphabet is grounding Loon. You know, when you name a project Loon, 
because it's kind of crazy, you shouldn't be too surprised if it doesn't go anywhere. It was what uh, Google and then later Alphabet calls a moonshot, uh, a, a long bet, a crazy idea that probably won't go anywhere. But hey, we're going to do it anyway because we have so much money <laughs> that we can do things like this. What was Loon? Well, uh, the idea was to give the entire world internet via balloons, big old balloons circling the uh, globe that would kind of, I guess they'd have a ground station beaming up to the balloon and then back down to you. They launched it, you know, a long time ago, 2013. The balloons were not just, you know, party balloons. They were really kind of, you know, fancy weather balloons that got, went up way up into the stratosphere and stuff. So they, they actually got to the point where they would be up there for months, years. Kind of hard to control where a balloon goes, but I guess the idea is if we launch enough of them, <laughs> I don't know. They used it in Peru after a big earthquake there. Remember after uh, the Hurricane Maria, they used it in Puerto Rico to give them internet access. They were actually doing it last year in Kenya, but now they've decided to ground loon, to pop the balloon, if it, if you will. The guy who heads these projects, he's part of the the Google X project, their moonshot factory, they call it, has a very appropriate name, Astro Teller. <laughs> he uh, actually said, you know what, time to pop the balloon. We, we probably should just stop. But he, you know, to be fair, he said, when I heard about it the first time, I only gave about a 1% or 2% chance of succeeding. So, you know... You know, there was a it was a moonshot. It was a long, long bet. Part of the problem is, you know, when they started doing this, the Internet only reached about three quarters of the earth. And so there was a lot of other people that could be served. Problem they found got to 93 percent. But the problem they found is that the remaining seven percent either couldn't afford the technology to get the signals like the, the fancy phones or didn't even want the Internet. <laughs> they said, we don't need that. Yes, believe it or not. In fact, I find this extremely encouraging. About 7% of the planet doesn't doesn't really care. So, and that plus the fact that Elon Musk is launching 12,000 satellites to do the same thing and they'll be a little bit more robust. Jeff Bezos's uh, Blue Origin wants to do something similar. There so there's other people kind of handling this. Cool technology. Giant balloons called the Loon, aptly named, but it's uh it's over. Oh. Google actually is uh, in the news too because of Australia. There, uh, there's a bill. It's not yet been voted on in the Australian, what do they call it, Parliament? I don't know. The Australian legislative body that would charge Google and Facebook for the. You know, when you search for a news story or you look at a news, you know, Google News or whatever, you get a little one or two lines from the article that they're referring to, and then a link, and you can read the rest. Seems to me a good thing. For the publishers, you know, that you get a taste of flavor of the article. Uh, the publishers say, no, you can't do that. In Australia, they want money for it. Rupert Murdoch leading the charge for this. If you're going to put snippets from our articles, you got to pay us, Google and Facebook. Now, it's not been, you know, voted in yet. It's a proposed legislation, proposed law. Mel Silva, who's Google's managing director in Australia, testified in front of a Senate. Oh, they call it the Senate. There you go. Committee that the proposed code was untenable, would set a dangerous precedent. And finally, she said, if you were to pass this law, it would give us no real choice but to stop making Google search available in Australia. Wow. That's like, that's the nuclear option. Yeah, fine. Go ahead and do that. You won't have us to kick around anymore. I saw some people say, yeah, fine, good. Let's make Google less powerful, less of a monolith, less dominant. I mean, it is really true. I, you know, in the U.S., I don't know. I think Google's only about 75% of all searches, but it's closer to 90% in much of the world. It's, that's a monopoly. And if, if something isn't on Google, it's almost like it's not on the Internet. It doesn't exist. How do you find it if it's not in Google? Now, I know there are other choices. There are lots of other choices. And that's why some people say, well, this is a good thing. Force people in Australia to use other things like Google, like uh, Microsoft Bing or DuckDuckGo or StartPage. Yeah, there are other choices. Apple just added a new uh, search engine 
option on the iPhone called Ecosia. It's a search engine that plants trees. Yeah, I'm not kidding. Eco. They, uh, they're based in Berlin. They donate 80% of their profits to organizations that focus on reforesting and planting trees. Ecosia. The problem with Bing, DuckDuckGo, Ecosia, and the others is their results. The search, you know, that's why Google's so popular is because when you search for something on Google, you pretty much get what you want, right? The results are useful. That's why Google completely dominated the search industry when, you know, 15 years ago, it beat Alta Vista and uh, there were a ton of other search engines now long forgotten. There was one that began with an L. Lycos. Remember that? No, no one does. Because Google came along and that was it. You know, I mean, that's the truth. If somebody has a monopoly. It's because people want what they got and Google's free and it does a good job. But, you know, so we'll see. I mean, I, if you were in Australia, if maybe you are an Australian and you lost Google, I guess you just say, well, that's, you know, not ideal, but we'll use DuckDuckGo or Ecosia. Hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, it's it'll be, we'll watch with interest. How about that? <laughs> I will be watching with interest. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? I mean, we get a lot of calls. We did, actually, uh, last year, towards the end of the year, because people had seen that, Adobe Flash was going away. You know, that's the technology that gave you dancing monkeys on the internet for so many years. In fact, when when uh, YouTube first started out, the videos on YouTube were in Flash. But Adobe uh, kind of ran into some headwinds with Flash. For one thing, it was kind of notoriously insecure. People had all sorts of security issues with it. But for another thing, uh, Apple, Steve Jobs, who kind of had an axe to grind with Adobe for other reasons, published a open letter on the front page of Apple.com way back in 2010 saying, we're not going to support Flash on our iPhones or on our iPads because we don't like it. It's it's a pig. It's slow. That was 10 years ago. It took 10 years to finally kill Flash. And December 31st, Flash went away. Adobe stopped using it. And we got a lot of calls from people saying, what am I going to do when my website is going to work and my game? And I think by now, probably, it's only the oldest sites, sites that haven't been updated in years that are still using Flash. And frankly, those probably won't ever be updated. They're abandonware. But most sites, I mean, YouTube stopped using Flash years ago. Funny story, though. <laughs> There's a railway system in northern China, Dalian, that was running on Flash. The whole railway system. Uh, they've known, we've known since 2017 the Flash was going away, but apparently whoever is running this railway system, the China Railway Shenyang, wasn't paying attention. By the way, I, Flash is a programming language. I guess you could do things like run a railway on it. I wouldn't want to, but you could. So the in, for 20 hours, the, sh the railroads in Dalian in Liaoning Province in <laughs> northern China weren't running. Staffers couldn't view train operating diagrams. They couldn't set up scheduling. They couldn't arrange shunting. Basically, everything stopped. How'd they fix it? They got a pirated version of Flash and they installed it at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> everything started working again. <laughs> That's probably the most extreme example of, we're not giving up Flash ever. They're running a pirated version of flash oh my anyway i'm glad you were here and i'm here and i'll be here next week and i hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech leo laporte the tech guy are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history i'm bill Continelli, w2xoy and i'll be back in a moment with another edition of the ancient amateur archives here on this week in amateur radio the Radio Act of 1912 was hopelessly obsolete by the early 1920s. Conceived in an era of long and medium wave spark telegraphy, the Act was totally inadequate when it came to broadcasting and the short waves. The Department of Commerce gamely tried to stretch the Act to meet the new requirements. The 1922 and 1924 regulations that banned broadcasting by amateurs set up the broadcast band and carved out the 160, 80, 40, 20, and 5 meter bands were really nothing more than gentlemen's agreements, valid as long as they weren't challenged. For a time they worked. Amateurs enthusiastically settled in on their new bands and began working the world 
while the number of broadcasters in the new 550 to 1500 kilocycle region jumped from 30 to almost 600 in just three years. Technical advances had not kept up with this growth, however, and there were problems. Crystal control of transmitters was still a couple of years away, and the unstable broadcasting stations drifted from their assigned frequencies, sometimes to the point of interfering with adjacent channels. Even stations off frequency by 400 to 600 cycles could cause ear-splitting heterodynes. Most receivers of the 1920s were either regenerative or TRF, tuned radio frequency, which were good on sensitivity and poor on selectivity. As a result, the 1920s broadcast band was saturated with only 600 stations. Compare that to today's medium wave where tight frequency control of 20 cycles coupled with directional antennas and selective superheterodyne receivers allows over 4,000 stations to occupy the AM broadcast band without undue interference. The Department of Commerce therefore issued regulations mandating such solutions as time sharing, where two or more stations occupied the same frequency at different times of the day, and daytime only operations. Stations were constantly moved to another frequency or told to decrease power in order to minimize interference. The department also went after stations whose transmitters drifted onto adjacent channels. An interesting example of this was the Los Angeles station of sister Amy Semple McPherson, an evangelist who was the leader of the International Church of the Four Square Gospel. Her station was notorious for drifting up and down the broadcast band. When the federal radio inspectors tried to keep her on frequency, she imperiously wrote to Secretary Hoover, demanding that his minions of Satan stay away from her transmitter. The Almighty would choose her wavelength, she wrote, not the Department of Commerce. Many of the stations that had been told to move, told to reduce power, or share their frequency did what any patriotic American would do, hire a lawyer. Once the legal bloodhounds began digging, certain things came to light. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution allows the federal government to regulate interstate commerce. Furthermore, it is an accepted fact that a federal agency cannot issue any regulations unless it was given the power to do so by Congress. Thus, the lawyers for the disgruntled stations challenged the Secretary's regulations on two fronts. First, that the Radio Act of 1912 gave the department no authority to regulate broadcasting stations, and second, that since many stations could not be heard across state lines, there was no interstate commerce and therefore no federal jurisdiction. This is the argument used by Radio Free Berkeley and other low-power pirate stations. The day of reckoning arrived in 1926 when an Illinois district court held that there was no federal law to permit the Secretary of Commerce to assign broadcasting licenses or frequencies. The Attorney General admitted that the federal government had no control over radio except what was specifically authorized in the 1912 Act. Pandemonium broke out. Stations, liberated from all federal control, upped their power, jumped frequency, and or began full-time operations on daytime or share time frequencies. Smaller stations were jammed off the air. Unlicensed transmitters appeared out of nowhere, dropped down on any convenient or inconvenient frequency, and began broadcasting. Anarchy was king. Amateurs, of course, could have legally joined in this RF orgy. There was nothing preventing them from getting back to broadcasting, moving to new frequencies, exceeding the one kilowatt limit, or anything else they desired. To their credit, they did nothing of the sort. One reason was the immense respect they felt for Secretary Hoover, a man who over and over publicly supported amateur radio in any way possible. They would abide by their gentleman's agreement with him. The other reason was common sense. They knew that Congress would soon rectify the problem by passing appropriate legislation. The broadcasters were big boys with a lot of money, powerful corporate backers, and six million listeners. They could afford to violate the spirit of the law and get away with it. Amateurs did not have this luxury. They realized that any violations of the 1922 and 1924 agreements, even if they were legally unenforceable, would cost them dearly in political support. So while the 550 to 1500 kilocycle segment was a free-for-all, the amateur bands were disciplined and orderly as hams mastered the art of crystal control and improved their operating skills. 
Incidentally, one area where these skills were honed was expeditions. From the Arctic to the Antarctic, from Macmillan to Byrd, amateurs provided the necessary communications of almost every major explorer. Also, in the area of emergencies, amateurs provided communications during snow and ice storms, hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods. The federal government quickly moved to end the chaotic mess on the broadcast band. The Radio Act of 1927 was approved on February 23rd. This law defined amateur radio for the first time in a federal statute and created the Federal Radio Commission, which was given the power to classify and regulate all aspects of all radio stations for the public interest, convenience, or necessity. Criminal penalties were written into the 1927 Act for violations of the Act or any regulation thereunder. The Commission immediately went to work. Minions of Satan got Sister Amy's station back on frequency and shut down the transmitter of KFKB, the station of Dr. John Brinkley, graduate of the Eclectic Medical School and proponent of prostate operations and, get this, goat gland transplants to cure all medical ills. Patients by the thousands listened to KFKB's broadcasts and flocked to Kansas to have the operations, picking out their goat from the pens next to the hospital as they went in. Do you think I could make this up? Unfortunately, after the commission shut him down, Dr. Brinkley went to Mexico by the Texas border, set up a 150,000 watt station, and continued his fraudulent operations. In regards to amateur radio, the commission, in effect, kept the status quo for the 15,000 hams. All agreements and regulations enacted by the Department of Commerce were maintained and incorporated into current regulations. The only change that hams noticed was the addition of a prefix on their calls. Thus, 1AW became W1AW, 1JS became W1JS, etc. However, the existence of a sympathetic commission and friendly regulations wasn't enough. Radio was truly international and, as a result, an international radio telegraph conference was scheduled in Washington, D.C. for October 4, 1927. Word was filtering out of Europe and the Far East that many governments were anti-amateur radio. How would our hobby fare at this conference? Join us the next time as the Ancient Amateur Archives has the answers. The superhead or superheterodyne receiver has been at the center of receiver technology for more than a hundred years, but do you know how it works? Most of us don't give much thought to that sort of thing anymore. The heart of the superhead is the intermediate frequency or IF stage or stages. Professor Alwyn Seeds of University College in London explains. It's in this section of the radio that the selectivity to reject signals on adjacent channels or frequencies is included. The IF is also the area that provides the majority of the gain of the radio, so often two or three stages may be used. Once the signals have been filtered and amplified in the IF, they are demodulated to recover the baseband information, such as the audio from the signal. Thanks to Electronic Notes and Southgate Amateur Radio News for that audio clip. You can see the full video on the Southgate site, www.southgate.org. It's in the September 22nd edition. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that sunspots returned on September 19th, but not in the profusion of a week earlier. Average daily sunspot numbers were 28.7 this past week, below the 58.3 average reported a week earlier. Average daily solar flux was down by 9 points from 87.4 to 78.4, but have no fear, things are looking up. Space weather woman Tamitha Scove WX6SWW offers a brief outlook on what's ahead. Oh my goodness, we can't even keep up with all the numbers that are of, of sunspots that have been coming out on the Earth-facing disk. We have already boosted that solar flux up into the low 80s and it could easily boost up into the mid to high 80s within the next couple days. So this is good news for amateur radio operators who need that solar flux to be boosted. Solar flux is predicted to be in the 90s starting on September 24th and continuing through the end of the month when it drops into the 80s. 
By the way, the northern autumnal equinox occurred at 1920 UTC on September 22nd, which means Earth is bathed in approximately equal amounts of solar radiation over the northern and southern hemispheres. That's supposed to be a good sign for HF propagation. Time now for the AMSAT report. Fun Cube 1, or AO73, will be in full sunlight starting over the next few days. As the satellite has been in continuous transponder mode, the command team has chosen to place it into continuous high-power telemetry mode. The satellite has been in operation for almost eight years now, and telemetry indicates that all systems are operating as well today as they did when it was launched. At present, the PSK-31 function of PSAT-2, or NL-104, has been turned off as a battery issue is being investigated. No information on when PSK-31 on NL-104 will resume. ARIS is seeking proposals from educational institutions and organizations that would like to host an amateur radio contact with an ISS crew member in space. The deadline for proposals for contacts between July and December 31st, 2022 closes on November 24th, 2021. Visit www.aris.com hyphen usa.org and click on the connect to ISS tab. The AMSAT report comes to us courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The 39th AMSAT Space Symposium and Annual General Meeting will be held on Friday through to Sunday, October the 29th to the 31st, 2021, at the Crown Plaza Hotel in Bloomington, Minnesota. Registration is now open for the event by visiting launch.amsat.org. Student registrations are available at $40, and general registration is at $75. Registration for the Saturday Evening Symposium Banquet is an additional $55. Full details are available on the registration website. The Crown Plaza Hotel is located at 3 Apple Tree Square, Bloomington, Minnesota, adjacent to the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport and only steps away from the Metro Blue Lines American Boulevard stop. Nearby shopping and tourist attractions include Mall of America, Sea Life, Nickelodeon Universe, and the Minnesota Zoo. The symposium includes presentations, exhibition space, and the AMSAT Annual General Meeting. The preliminary schedule is presented at launch.amsat.org. The AMSAT Board of Directors Meeting will be held before the symposium on October the 28th and 29th at the same hotel. Those attending may make hotel reservations by calling the hotel directly or online. When booking, use the group name Amateur Satellite Group. Platinum and Titanium members of the AMSAT President's Club receive free admission to the symposium and receive a complimentary lunch with the President on Saturday afternoon. Please email members at amsat.org to arrange registration. Presenters are invited to participate at the symposium or submit a paper to the symposium proceedings. Read the call for papers at www.amsat.org for more information. Patients at the Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. are not likely to forget a remarkable 10-minute question and answer exchange on Tuesday, September 21st between an ISS astronaut and young patients in the Pediatric Acute Care Hospital in America's capital city. According to Bob Kopecki, AA6TB, the event's technical mentor, the Aries contact was arranged with Seacrest Studios, the educational space inside the hospital to continue patients' education while they are receiving treatment there. The space and communications component is coordinated with the help of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, NASA, and local Alexandria Amateur Radio Club. Bob said the hospital's proposal for the ISS contact had been accepted in March of 2020, but concerns for COVID safety changed the shape of the event. Instead of using an on-site amateur radio station for the contact, it would rely instead on a multi-point telebridge with Claudio Ariati 1K1 SLD in Italy, eliminating the need for a large gathering of people. The patients stayed in their rooms connecting to the action via an iPad and the help of a hospital staffer. JAXA astronaut Ahikiko Hoshide KE5DNI 
was ready and fielded 16 questions using the call sign OR4ISS during the 10-minute pass. More than 1,300 students and patients from kindergarten to 12th grade enjoyed the event along with 500 patients and 400 professionals. A recording of the contact is available on YouTube. Meanwhile, the application period begins on October 1st for proposals for ARIES contacts in 2022. Two busy days of amateur radio activities are on tap for attendees of the Slidell EOC Hamfest, sponsored by the Ozone Amateur Radio Club. It's going to be held in the Slidell Auditorium with doors opening at 2 p.m. on Friday, October 8th, and at 8 a.m. on Saturday, October 9th. Entrance for the public is through the lobby doors. Hamfest Chairman Dave Hartley, K5OZ, reminds everyone that masks are mandatory for all indoor activities in Louisiana, so they will be required to attend the Hamfest. Meanwhile, even as hams in Louisiana prepare for their ham fest, members of the Peoria Area Amateur Radio Club in Illinois are celebrating the fact that they just finished enjoying the return of their Superfest. It took place on September 18th and 19th, and according to the news reports, there are two other reasons to feel encouraged. The club also saw an uptick in membership, especially among YLs. As of 2021, there are nine radio amateurs who actually live permanently on the island of Bonaire and who are also active. Apart from that, at least six Papa Juliet 4 call signs were issued to amateurs who live outside Bonaire but who have an address on the island. So the group have decided to start their own radio club, the Bonaire Amateur Radio Club, B-A-R, with club call sign Papa Juliet 4 Bravo Alpha Romeo. The club meets weekly at the Terra Cora Ranch from 6pm until late at night. To celebrate the formation of the club, BAR organised a field day on the seafront at Sorabon Beach between August the 27th and the 29th. The BAR webpage is currently under construction. wwwpapajuliet 4 bravo alpha romeo dot club. You can QSL contacts with PJ4BAR via their QSL manager, Mike Zero Uniform Romeo X-Ray. If you're devoted to weather watching, you might want to take a look at the 2021 Virtual National Hurricane Conference Amateur Radio Workshop. It was held in June and is now posted on YouTube. The conference lasts four hours and eight minutes, but if there's a particular workshop you're interested in, you can find an index and the appropriate start times below the video on the site. Workshops include a discussion of surface reports, overviews of National Hurricane Center and Hurricane Watch Network, and best practices in Skywarn for tropical systems. Six prominent radio amateurs in IARU Region 1 have been recognized for their years of contributions. Six amateurs in Region 1 of the International Amateur Radio Union have been awarded medals for their years of work contributing to the AIRU. They are Tor Warren, LA9QL, who recently stepped down as the Region 1 EMC Committee Chairman, but remains on the committee. Tor is being recognized for bolstering IARU's presence in electromagnetic compatibility matters. Medal recipient Jacques Verlijen, ON4AVJ, is being recognized for developing the contest working group and coordinating work on VHF, including revision of the handbook. He's a member of the Political Relations Committee and Secretary to the VHF Plus Committee. Hans Wielens, ON6WQ, is being honored for supporting smaller societies, most especially in Africa, and creating the concept of support to the Amateur Radio Service, or STARS, which he chaired until 2011. The medal to Dave Court, EI3IO, celebrates his work on the Spectrum and Regulatory Liaison Committee, which he chaired until recently. His work, among other things, helped lead to the region-wide allocation to the Amateur Service of a 2 MHz segment at 50 MHz. Hillary Clayton Smith, G4JKS, is being credited for the region's successful work in EMC matters. Hillary is an EMC committee member and served as its secretary for nearly 25 years. A medal was also given to Peter Jost, HB9CET, deputy coordinator for the AIRU monitoring system, for his work with the monitoring system's newsletters. Emmett Bercy has owned and run a radio shack for more than 30 years. 18 years in their current location in Smyrna, but he is now being forced to close his store. It is one of the four remaining Radio Shack brick and mortar stores in Middle Tennessee. We were notified by our shopping center on September 14th of this year that our lease will be terminated in 30 days. As such, 
We are currently having a closed the store sale since we do not have the means to relocate nor anywhere to relocate to. His Radio Shack store sold consumer electronics such as headphones, in-wall speakers, Bluetooth, solder equipment, Raspberry Pi, Arduino, components like resistors, capacitors, switches, and cables, and PC boards as well as batteries and some store fixtures. We are part of the community, said Bressy, and we have always had one-on-one -on -one rapport with our customers. We tailored our products to our local customers' needs when possible. Unlike big box stores, Bressy and his staff always prided themselves on taking the time to figure out what the customer's problem was and work together to find a solution. They loved having customers come back in once they successfully completed their project or fixed their issue to let them know it worked and how happy they were. Helping our customers succeed has always been very gratifying and it has given us a sense of fulfillment, said Brassi. They have also been involved in the community for many years, participating in community events such as Halloween in the Park in Smyrna, and they assisted in Science Olympiad with Smyrna Middle and High School. STEM and STEAM are the future for the next generations, said Brassi. We enjoyed helping kids learn about science, engineering, and technology. It's been a pleasure to serve our community for the past two decades, said Brassi, through the highs and lows. We are extremely disappointed that we will be unable to provide electronics service and solutions to our loyal current customers, friends, and family. The Radio Shack brand has been in business since 1921. However, it has had many ups and downs. It began by supplying parts to ham radio operators and audio gear to audiophiles across the country. Reaching its peak in the 1990s when it sold more personal computers than any other company. Much of the current Radio Shack business is now being done online. Brissy's personal approach is rare, and the closing of this store will be the end of an era. If you ever get the feeling someone is watching you, maybe they are listening too. At least they might be listening to what's coming over your computer speakers, thanks to a new web cyber attack called Glowworm. In this novel attack, careful observations of a light-emitting diode on a powered loudspeaker allowed an attacker to reproduce the sound playing thanks to virtually imperceptible fluctuations in the LED brightness, most likely due to the speaker's power supply sagging in voltage slightly on loudness peaks and then recovering. You might think that if you can see the LED, you could just hear the output of the speaker, but a telescope through a window from a hundred feet away appears to be sufficient. You could imagine that from a distance across a noisy office, you might be able to pull the same trick. We don't know, but we suspect, even if headphones were plugged into the speakers, the LED would still react to the audio modulation. Any device supplying power to the speakers is a potential source of a leak. On the one hand, this is insidious because, unlike more active forms of bugging, this would be pretty much undetectable. On the other hand, there are a variety of low-tech and high-tech mitigations to the attack too. A low-tech solution? Well, close the blinds of your room or cover the LED light with some tape. A high-tech solution might be to feed a random frequency into the LED to destroy any leaking information. A super spy tech solution would be to put fake speakers in front of your real speakers that silently play back misinformation on their LEDs. You can see the full story at hackaday.com. In the article, a video plays samples of recovered speech and honestly it was clear enough to detect what was being said, but it wasn't great. Passive bugs like this are hard to find. Even a fancy junction detector won't tell you if your speakers are compromised by glowworm. Our thanks go to Stephen, G7 Victor Foxtrot Yankee, for this story. Foundations of Amateur Radio Since December 2010, I've been licensed as a radio amateur. For some, this seems like a long time ago. For others, it's just the beginning. In my time thus far, I've attempted to document and describe my journey, and in doing so, I've had the unbeatable pleasure of hearing stories from others who were inspired by my efforts to join, or rejoin the hobby. It occurred to me that it's hard to tell when you look at any one amateur if the ink on their license is still wet, 
or if the whole certificate is faded and yellowed with time. You also cannot tell by looking if one amateur turns on their gear in the car during the daily commute, or if they go out on expeditions to remote locations twice a year. The call sign a person holds tells you even less, let alone the class of their license. In our community we talk about mentoring, and we call such people Elmers. But do we really use this as a way to glue together our hobby, as its namesake might suggest? As a result of my profile, there's a steady stream of commentary about what I do and how I do it. As you might expect, there's both good and bad, sometimes describing the same thing from opposite sides in equally heated terms. I'd like to take this opportunity to point out that playing the man and not the ball will get you completely ignored. If, however, you have a specific grievance with any technical aspect of what I'm contributing, by all means let me know but be prepared to provide references, because it might come as a surprise. I do research before I open my mouth. That's not to say that I don't make mistakes. I'm sure I do, and have. Before this turns into a self-congratulatory oration, I'd like to point out that all the negative feedback I see all around me does nothing to grow our hobby, does nothing to encourage learning, does nothing to reward trial and error, and it doesn't contribute to society at large in any way. I'm mentioning this because I also receive emails from amateurs who have left the community, not because of lack of interest, but because of the bullying that they've experienced. I know that there are several local activities that I avoid because it's just not fun to bump into people who are friendly to your face whilst being vicious online. It continues to amaze me that this topic keeps recurring, and that it keeps needing to be called out. One thing I can tell you is that ignoring it doesn't work. I've described previously what you should do instead when you're the subject of such petulant behaviour, but it bears repeating. Say it out loud. Thank you for your comment. I don't believe that it's in the spirit of amateur radio. Please stop. Feel free to use that phrase any time someone in this hobby makes you feel uncomfortable. One final observation, if you've not personally experienced this behaviour, that's great, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, or that it's not endemic. Consider for a moment how you'd feel if you were attacked whilst being active in a hobby you love, for no other reason than that the person attacking you didn't like the wire you were using to construct a dipole, or some other equally outrageous reason like your gender, sexual orientation, license class, choice of radio, or preferred on-air activity. Say it with me. Thank you for your comment. I don't believe that it's in the spirit of amateur radio. Please stop. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike, with your month-ending Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for more information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. This month in Parks on the Air news, we have two exciting updates to share with everybody. Uh, first, we are excited to announce that we have recently added over 1,000 parks to the Parks on the Air system. For the last several months, we've had a small contingent of volunteers combing through user requests to add additional parks, validating that those requested parks meet the criteria for inclusion in poda, and formatting the list so that they could be added to the system. After hundreds of volunteer hours, the lists are now in the system and ready for you to go activate. Check out the maps and search pages at poda.app to see if any of these new units are in your area. Also in poda news, we are excited to share that we are formalizing a Parks on the Air support desk. You can always continue to get community support via the Facebook group or via the poda help channel in the poda Slack group, but we have a small group of volunteers that have agreed to be on a rotating schedule to help you with your official technical support questions. To reach the official POTA support desk, all you need to do is send an email to help at parksontheair.com. We have coverage for most days of the week, so you will usually get a response within 24 hours, but no worse than 48 hours based on our volunteers' schedules. We won't solve every problem that fast, but you'll know that we're on it. Issues requiring level 2 support are generally resolved within the week. And now for our monthly update. August was a very busy month for Parks on the Air. During the month, there were over 180,000 contacts made by about 1,200 different activators. 
They put nearly 3,000 parks on the air from 25 different DX entities, and all of those parks and entities were hunted by more than 23,000 different hunters. The top activators for the month were K7CAR with 3,399 QSOs and W0YES, who activated 72 different parks. The top hunter for the month was N5HA with 967 QSOs while hunting 691 different parks. In our POTA DX corner, Canada was unsurprisingly the most active entity outside of the continental United States, with 12,382 QSOs being made from parks in the Great White North. Not to be outdone, however, we had quite a bit of activity from Japan, Alaska, Puerto Rico, England, Wales, France, and many others. The top DX activators for the month were VE9MY with 1,579 QSOs and VE2NCG who activated 26 parks. And this concludes our August 2021 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. CEO Michelle Thompson, W5NYV, reports that the Open Research Institute received an advisory opinion from the U.S. Commerce Department Bureau of Industry and Security on September 2nd. The letter confirmed that public internet posts regarding open source amateur satellite communications work are not subject to export administration regulation. The Open Research Institute was founded in March 2018 by Bruce Perens, K6BP, in order to provide a formal structure for open source satellite work. Prior work by ORI established that open source amateur radio satellite communications work was free of international traffic and arms regulation. This is a significant regulatory success for open source amateur satellite work and open source in general, Thompson said. In a later post on the ORI site, Thompson said ITAR and EAR have had a dramatic effect on both commercial and amateur satellite work since the 1990s. The regulations are blamed for a significant decline in the U.S. market share for satellite systems and halted highly successful international amateur collaborations, she wrote. Open source work that is published as it is created and is freely available to the general public at no cost is not subject to ITOR or EAR, Thompson said. ORI's work was funded by the ARDC with legal assistance provided by Thompson and Burke LLP. All documents and links to presentations about the work are available. Thank you to those who have supported and assisted ORI during the many stages of this successful regulatory endeavor, Thompson said. ORI will build upon the work to advance the aims and purposes of open source amateur satellites. Some open research institute projects include Phase 4 Ground Station, Digital Microwave Broadband Communication System for Space and Terrestrial Amateur Radio Use. Phase 4 Space, Digital Microwave Broadband Communication System for Space, 6U, Geo, and Interplanetary. Both Phase 4 projects rely on an open source version of DVB S2 slash X and polyphase filter banks. With FDMA uplink at 5 GHz and TDM downlink at 10 GHz. The M17 project is a new alternative digital radio protocol. Headed by Wojcik, SP5 WWP in Poland, a team of several other amateur radio operators are also involved in the M17 project. Visit the Open Research Institute website's Getting Started page for more information and to get involved. To celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty signature, the Russian Robinson Club will be activating the following special event stations, each representing a country that initially signed the Antarctic Treaty, between October the 1st and December the 31st. Romeo 60 Alpha November Tango will represent Russia. Using the same Alpha November Tango suffix, prefix Romeo Golf 60 will represent Argentina, Romeo November 60 will be the prefix for Norway, and South Africa will use Romeo Alpha 60. Romeo Juliet 60 will be in the call for Japan, 
Romeo Tango for Australia, Romeo Bravo for Belgium, and Romeo Kilo 60 Alpha November Tango will be the call sign representing the United Kingdom. Romeo Uniform 60 will be the USA station, while Romeo Charlie 60 will be for Chile, Romeo Lima 60 for France, and Romeo Zulu 60 for New Zealand. Plus, there will be a special call sign for Antarctica itself, Romeo India 60 Alpha November Tango. The Worldwide Antarctic Programme has already issued a reference number for each of the above special call signs. Check www.waponline.it to download the whole set of WAP reference numbers issued for this event. QSL info is also included. Details about the special 60th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty Award is also available at that webpage. www.waponline.it A Canadian astronomer is urging that international regulations be established to set limits on permissible levels of satellite brightness. Samantha Lawler of the University of Regina in Saskatchewan said the ever-increasing population of communication satellites, such as those launched by SpaceX's Starlink, generate the kind of light pollution that hampers astronomers' research. The scientist was part of a team that included researchers from the University of British Columbia and the University of Toronto, who studied the optical brightness of thousands of satellites, including those in so-called mega-constellations. The team concluded that in the not-too-distant future, one of every 15 points of light in the sky will actually be a satellite. The research team also expressed concern about the crowding of satellites in orbit, increasing the possibility of more collisions. Pocket calculator inventor and home computing pioneer Sir Clive Sinclair died at his home on September 16th following a long illness. He was 81. Sinclair may have been best known for popularizing the home computer. Leaving school at age 17, he worked for four years as a technical journalist to fund Sinclair Radionics and created the Sinclair Spectrum and the first computer, the Sinclair ZX81. Many modern-day titans of the games industries got their start on one of his ZX models. Back in the day, the gamer's computer of choice was either the ZX Spectrum 48K or its rival, the Commodore 64. Among his other inventions was a coin-sized radio. Despite his computer background, Sinclair declined to use the Internet, email, or even computers. He was also involved in developing various personal transport systems, including an electric vehicle. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is... Arizona Zone, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. According to my skydiving son, Daryl, N9SBH, during a 300-foot fall, a person can accelerate to speeds of between 90 to 120 miles per hour. That's 144 feet per second. This creates a sudden application of mechanical energy to the human skeleton upon impact with the ground or other solid object. This energy is sufficient to shatter bones, destroy vital internal organs, and cause severe trauma that would be nearly impossible to survive. Even a fall from a 50-foot tower, which would last less than three quarters of one second, can inflict a deadly blow to the human body. The only protection from this type of injury is the proper use of climbing safety gear. Please keep in mind that rock climbing gear is not designed for use on towers. But with a common sense approach towards safety, this type of gear can be used on towers more safely than ordinary waist belt only type belts you've seen advertised. Last month I told you about the tragic death of a young man from southern Indiana after he fell from a phone company microwave tower in northern Indiana. This month another story, this time a happy ending. On May 27th, a climber was replacing lamps on a commercial tower on top of a 3,000 foot mountain overlooking Victorville, California when he slipped and was left hanging from the tower held only by a safety gear. Luckily the man had a working HT he used to summon help. He was brought safely to the ground within three hours. Stories like this serve to remind us all that our gear must be used properly to be effective. If you're gonna climb, 
wear and use your belt or stay off the tower. That's the simple rule. No belt, no climb. I've timed myself. It took me 45 seconds to properly put my belt on. It takes me 5 to 10 minutes to climb to 150 feet in good weather. This 45 seconds is time well spent. So maybe you're not going to scale a 700 foot steel beauty, but the little TV tower next to your house. It's easy to underestimate the danger of a fall from a 40-foot tower, so let's make the whole discussion unnecessary. Wear your belt. Encourage all other hams to use their belts. Together we can make climbing-related deaths a part of radio history and not its future. We can also reduce the chance of climbing injuries related to minor things such as sore legs, backs, shoulders, and other parts of the body. A simple method for reducing injury for the infrequent climber is a simple warm-up exercise. One of my favorites is a short, brisk bicycle ride for a couple of blocks before climbing. This loosens up the leg and back muscles and improves mental alertness. But if a short bike ride is not in the cards for you, then consider a quick leg stretching exercise before the climb. You'll feel better afterwards the more you physically prepare ahead of time. To sum up, always use a belt, even if you're only climbing to 25 feet on your own TV tower. Stretch those legs before starting the climb to reduce painful muscles that night and the next day. And never climb alone, especially at night. Always climb with a babysitter. Even a sitter linked to you only by HT is better than climbing alone. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Here's this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars a members-only benefit. To register, check out upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions, please visit the ARRL Learning Network webinar page. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded Learning Network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. Working the Pile Up, presented by Ron Delpierre Smith, KD9 IPO, will be presented on Tuesday, October 5th, 2021, at 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 1700 UTC. Ron Delpierre Smith, KD9 IPO, Vice President of the Chicago Suburban Radio Association and an ARRL assistant section manager in Illinois will offer an enlightening discussion on working a pileup from both sides of the contact. Whether your interest lies in ARRL field day, contesting, special events, or rare DX, this is a must-see presentation. Ron will discuss search and pounce and running techniques, when to use them, and some tips on working them to your advantage. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. Al Williams' Whiskey Delta 5 Golf November Romeo writes on Hackaday about learning Morse code, detailing the specific method devised by a gentleman called Ludwig Koch. Most countries have dropped the requirement for learning Morse code to become a ham radio operator now. Because of that, you might think that Morse code is dead, but it isn't. Some people like the nostalgia. Some like that you can build simple equipment to send and receive Morse code. Others like it that Morse code is much more reliable than voice and some of the older digital modes. Regardless of the reason, many people want to learn Morse code, and it is still a firm part of the ham radio scene. Morse code has a reputation for being hard to learn, but it turns out that this is mostly because people haven't been taught code in a good way. In his article, Al says that in the past, some youth organizations used to promote some particularly bad ways of learning the code. The very worst way was to use an image, trying to map the dots and dashes of a letter into the letter shape. This is a bad idea. The problem is, it's nearly impossible to hear sounds at 20 or 30 words per minute and map them into a visual representation. The second worst way was to just learn dots and dashes, but many people did learn that way. The third worst way to learn, and unfortunately a way many of us did learn, and it's still in use today, was to send Morse code very slowly for beginners. That's great, but it limits you when you're trying to go faster. Today, the Farnsworth method, named after Donald Farnsworth, is still very common. The idea is to send the code at the target speed that you'd like to learn, but space it out so that the average speed is much slower. 
For example, your coach might send at 15 words per minute, but spaced out, so it was really averaging about five words a minute. Well, that makes sense. You can hear the sound you'll hear when you're proficient, but you'll have time to think about it. As you get more proficient, you reduce the gaps until you're at normal spacing. Al says that a less common but very effective way to learn is the Koch method, named after a psychologist called Ludwig Koch. Like the Farnsworth method, you send characters at the target speed. What's different is that you send only two characters. When the person copying the code can copy 90% accurately, the coach adds a third character into the mix. You continue with those three characters until the learner is back to 90% proficiency. And then a fourth character shows up and the whole process repeats until the learner can copy all of the characters. This is surprisingly effective because it naturally makes you pay attention to the sound and not the individual dots and dashes. Koch was able to teach a class of students to copy code at 12 words per minute in under 14 hours. You can read the whole of Al's fascinating Hackaday post at hackaday.com. And finally this week, hams are often early adopters of new technology, such as FT8, but this was not the case with single sideband amplitude modulation. First referenced in Major General George Squire's 1911 patent that had nothing to do with RF applications, single sideband didn't really catch on as a popular ham radio phone mode until the 1960s. Antique Wireless Association Museum curator Ed Gable, K2MP, recounted the history of single sideband as part of the inaugural Antique Wireless Association Shares Program, presented on August 19th. Gable described Squire as an early idea man in the history of single sideband at a time when hams had hardly adopted AM in any form. As Gable explained, John Renshaw Carson built on Squire's patents to define the principles of single sideband radio transmission theory using a balanced modulator and filters. AT&T went all in with single sideband, basing its first long-haul telephone system on the technology. Its single sideband voice service to Europe, which kicked off in 1923, lasted for more than three decades. A receiving site in Scotland took advantage of beverage antennas put in place for the AWRL transatlantic tests. Gable credited Robert M. Moore, W6DEI, with introducing single sideband to the ham radio community through an article in R9 magazine in the early 1930s. It had a really minor impact at the time. One thing you have to remember is the time. It was 1932. Uh, there was some, something called the Depression going on. People were more worried about uh, where is dinner coming from tonight than where can I get parts to build a uh, single sideband radio, uh, which was very difficult to do. And the biggest thing is there was no perceived need. The bands weren't so crowded that you needed a uh, transmission mode that had uh, more efficiency and narrower uh, bandwidth. The technology remained more of a curiosity, however, in part because of the Great Depression, cost, and technical difficulty. Besides, hams of that era saw no real advantage to narrowband mode since bands were not that crowded. The mood began to change after World War II, though. In 1948, Oswald Villard, W6QIT, engineered the airing of single sideband signals via Stanford University's W6YX, reintroducing the mode to a burgeoning and more technically savvy post-war ham community that included a lot of veterans. A 1950 GE Ham News article by Don Norgard, W2KUJ, described plans for a 5-watt, 3-tube single sideband transmitter he dubbed the SSB Junior. Expanding on this, Central Electronics' Wes Schum, W9DYV, built the first single sideband exciter, the 10A, in 1952, and it became the company's first product, spawning a series of successor products that included a VFO based on a modified BC-458 military surplus transmitter, an SSB slicer for receiving, and even a linear. Single sideband equipment was neither inexpensive nor accessible, however. Cheap and Easy SSB by Anthony Vital, W2EWL, which appeared in QST in 1956, spoke to Ham's attitudes, helping to advance the adoption of single sideband among radio amateurs. Byron Goodman, W1DX, addressed receiver improvements with his QST article, The Product Detector. In the same decade, General Curtis LeMay, K3JUY, stroke K4RFA, promoted the advantages of single sideband to the military heralding a phase-out of AM as the dominant voice technology. Many hams were not convinced of single sideband's advantages, deriding the signals as sounding like Donald Duck. Adoption didn't really take off until the Collins KWM-1 came along in 1957. It was the first single sideband transceiver to share receiver and transmitter circuitry. 
Heathkit, Viking, and B&W produce single sideband adapters for use with current AM gear. Other manufacturers, including National and Swan, came along to further boost adoption of the mode, and it wasn't that many years before single sideband eclipsed AM as the predominant voice mode on the HF bands. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Letter, the AWRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the W0 GMM repeater on 147.285 MHz in Grove, Oklahoma, serving Northeast Oklahoma, Southwest Missouri, and Northwest Arkansas. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.